this is exciting. I want to say that I'm in a, an interesting position here because we're here to talk about the media. We're here to talk about politics and the media and the politics of media. So what I'm hoping is that we can have a kind of a freewheeling conversation around the nature of media engagement with political parties, with political leaders, and with making the news uh, on the occasions that p politicians and, and media find them in the position, themselves in a position of jointly being newsmakers. So I'm gonna dive right in. Um, and I'm gonna ask, I suppose, a little bit of an existential question. Because I entered politics 11 years ago this year, actually, 2007. And um, I joined the DA when it was a 12% party, when um, its MPs could remember the days when the DA was a 7% party. And media coverage was like the holy grail, right? It was something that you needed existentially in order to be able to win votes, to be part of the debates, to engage. So it's quite interesting that I'm sitting on stage with a group of opposition politicians, one who was the first woman to found her own political party in South Africa. And so I'd love to have your views about what it has been like interacting with the media as opposition parties. We heard Stephen and the panel talking earlier about all the attention the ANC gets. How does it feel in the opposition to have this really interesting relationship with the press, where you've got to punch above your weight, where you've got to work together but also be suspicious of each other, where the relationship is intimate but distant? Uh, what are some of the complexities? And, and Patricia, if I could begin with you, if you could tell us about your experience building a political party from scratch, the ID, and what it felt like, especially around the time of the arms deal, to interact with a press that maybe didn't take you seriously as a political force, uh, in a context in which you were fighting against the behemoth that was the ANC. Yes. Well, I've learned very early in my political career that you don't always fight with people or journalists that are in charge of a couple of million <laughs> barrels of ink. But I can also say the value that the media has added to my life is they saved my life when I was the whistleblower in the arms deal because I was able to share that information with them when I got death threats, my argument was that if they want to kill me, they must know more people have the information. So I'm always grateful for that. And the value of the media to hold politicians to account, uh, to speak truth to power, uh, being the fourth estate has played an important role in our country, especially also during the years of apartheid. So we need to maintain the independence of the media. But I think like any structure in our society, there's always time to reflect, like Mondley said earlier on. And I hope today we can speak frankly and, and nobody will hold against me if I, if I maybe fear you a bit, because I think it's also necessary. <laughs> But when I started the Independent Democrats, I want, I, it was a personal goal and a personal ambition. I wanted to become the first woman in the country, in our new democracy, our new constitution, to claim those rights in the constitution. I wanted to become the first woman to start a political party, contest election, win seats at all three spheres of government. And it was hell. Um, you know, people said, oh, that woman is mad. Uh, but seven days a week that I work and traveled around the country, for me it was about illustrating that the right in our constitution is meaningless unless we claim them. And the, the media played an important role in helping me to get that message across. Yes. Pumzile, tell us about your experience. You were DA national spokesperson. It's a role I've been in before. I understand the complexity, the phone that rings endlessly, the always being available to answer every imaginable question. Because of course, again, if you're an opposition party and you're not likely to get coverage, often you need voters to see you, to be visible. So what are those pressures like, the complexities of building relationships with a media that's actually a little bit hostile? Well, I think the DA has a pretty fairly good relationship with the media. We are ardent believers in media freedom and, free and journalistic freedom and will be the first people out of the blocks when journalists are attacked. 
But I do think um, in terms of how they cover the, 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 the DA, they're stuck in a narrative of the DA being a white party, a racist party, and even though the evidence is not there, I mean, Musi is a black person, the majority of our provincial leaders are black, but the media refuses to speak, <laughs> refuses to see out of this box. In fact, I was having a debate on Facebook with a um, person I went to Rhodes with, who is an hour respected investigative journalist. And I was saying to him, you have these preconceived notions of, about the DA. You're an investigative journalist. Why don't you actually go really investigate what the DA is about? Is it really racist? Is it really only a white party? And, and find that information. So that's the gripe that I have with the media. But generally, we have a good relationship. Well, there'll be argy bargies one a few times, but generally, I, I think we have a good relationship with them. <laughs> so I, I learned this term in the United States. It's incredibly disrespectful, but Americans are very friendly and they make it sound nice. I'm going to push back against you, Pums, and I'm going to say to you, and I'm going to be a bit spicy as well, <laughs> that a political party that in 2018, 2018 is still debating whether redress should be race-based or not may have challenges around race, right? So, but I'm also going to, I'm going to throw you a bone and I'm going to say one of the things the media does repeatedly is predict the coming of the end of the DA, right? Every election is the year the DA is going to reach the glass ceiling. So, what do you think the balance is between the truth and the falsehood, right? How much do the media get right and how much in a sense feels like wishful thinking, like they maybe wish the DA as a, you know, a going concern would not be successful in the next election. Any time there's any strife in the DA, the next day, the, the end of the DA is coming. What is happening right now is that we going through a policy review process, which any party that takes itself seriously should do from time to time. Um, I'm no longer the national spokesperson of the DA, so I speak for myself. I, um, I mean, the DA is sort of a broad church of liberals. There's classical liberals, there's social liberals. I consider myself a social liberal. So for me, race is absolutely a proxy for disadvantage. And that is currently actually the party's position as was adopted at the federal council you were at. So we'll see what, once the party has had its debate in the structures, what the final document looks like, but I certainly hope it will be one that recognizes South Africa's history, recognizes the need to redress uh, the historical injustices, and one that recognizes that race remains a proxy for disadvantage in South Africa. Yes, so too. Do, do feel free to applaud, right? So, um, so um, mm -hmm. you are in a political party, I think in a similar position to where the ID was before the party merged with the DA, where your leader is quite a compelling, uh, iconic, well-known person in his own right, um, such that perhaps there's a blurring of lines between General Holomisa and the UDM. Um, to what extent do you sometimes feel like you're a representative of your leader rather than a representative of your organization? And I, and I want to talk in terms of the media, which often places the general in a position where he must speak as a former ANC member, as a former ANC leader, as someone who's a, who can appeal to the ANC's softer underbelly. H how does that feel as, a, as an opposition party, again, trying to establish yourself, trying to punch above your weight, trying to grow, when the media often reflect your political party in the image of its leader? No, correct. It's a very good question, Lindy. I think it's uh, the narrative that is dominant in the media is similar to what Pumzile was complaining about, that if you look at the United Democratic Movement over the past couple of years, ever since I joined it in 2007, I think cumulatively I've actually gotten more airtime than the general himself on any given year. Uh, but the narrative is that it's still a one-man show. We have, over the past few years, tried to give exposure, for instance, to other leaders within the party who are predominantly young, uh, and we're trying to find female leaders exactly that can play a meaningful role in the party, in the leadership of the organization. 
But the dominant narrative has always been that the UDM is a one-man show. And you can come out of an NEC meeting where as a collective you've discussed issues and, and decided on a number of resolutions, but the minute you communicate those resolutions, it's all OMESA and not the UDM. Mm. Uh, but the other problematic issue with this narrative is that you are quite correct in saying that it, it, it sort of portrays us to the public as an ANC light rather than a united democratic movement. So when you sell the UDM even to the public or you're trying to campaign, people always associate yourself with the ANC, but because you are ANC light, people will always go for the real thing, not mm -hmm. the United Democratic Movement. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. The other issue where I think we, we have managed to distinguish ourselves, look, we, we operate in a post-truth era where it's, politicians can lie as long as those lies are going to deliver them either to parliament or to political power, they don't care. In fact, I think we're in an environment currently where people say lies have short legs, but if they can deliver you to parliament and political power, so what? You'll mm -hmm. think of a different lie after the elections. Mm -hmm. But now the problem that we have is that the coverage of the media, whether it's in South Africa, continental, and other parts of the world, doesn't help us to un unmask those, those lies in order for the public to be able to make informed decisions. It's not enough to just portray us the way we are and say this is what we're saying, but to some extent I think we need to yeah. be able to help the people to make informed decisions about issues. But where we are trying to play, look, if you try to tell the truth, if you try to, to provide leadership that is based on principles of integrity, all the right kind of principles, the universal principles, you are not going to make headline news. Mm -hmm. Because look, it doesn't sell. But we've been consistent around issues that are about South Africa. The only difference, for an example, if you were to say, uh, with uh, how the DA, going back to the question you asked earlier, is to say it's a priority that we redress past imbalances and backlogs in South Africa. It's something that we can no longer postpone. That is why uh, the, the fact that, in fact, I should say that we've postponed this discussion and how we should be able to take it forward and come up with concrete pro 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 proposals or programs that we can implement is the reason why now we're having these race discussions where the issues around race have become a common issue, including uh, some of the challenges that are threatening social cohesion. But we're saying that so long as you say, if you're saying you are creating an open opportunity to society, I agree. But the first thing that you must consider is that uh, implicit in that open opportunity to society vision is the assumption that the level of readiness among our people to take advantages that such a society would provide is the same. And if you consider the past, it's definitely not the same. So interventions are needed to be able to give people a hand up, to be able to give people the enough support to be able to do whatever they need in society. So I'm trying to say that if you were to look at all these proposals, ideological positions of parties, mm -hmm. that working together would be able to meet at the center and draw from the strengths of the different political parties in the interest of building a better South Africa for all. If I can just add something. Um, I'll be a bit spicy here. I think the reason why maybe the UDM is sort of linked to the ANCs because you don't have policies that, are, that have a clear blue water between you and the ANC. And that's a process we're engaged in, in finding unique solutions, solutions that are uniquely DA. But the media constantly analyzes us through an ANC prism. So they, they don't understand how the DA works. They don't understand when you say, we are going to try and find a different policy. So they stuck in this ANC narrative and they analyze everything from the ANC. Mm -hmm. So if it doesn't sort of fit into the ANC narrative, then it's, it's, it's wrong. Mm. Quite correct, can I? I mean, you raise an important, you raise an important point, Pumzil. At what, at what stage do you earn your stripes as a political party such that you get to be judged on the basis of your own record? Now, Patricia, you and I yeah. remember the 2011 election where we did this quite radical thing. We ran a campaign based on the DA's record in government. And it a little bit put the ANC on the back foot because they were suddenly in a position where they had to respond to our claim that yeah. the official opposition ran the best local governments in the country, and that kind of change. So how much of that is about political party strategy, and how much of that is down to you know, just a media that lacks imagination? That's my first question. I also want to tack onto that, doesn't being in government, Patricia, give you more 
heft, more credibility. In other words, I'm trying to say, what is it like on the other side, right? When your yes. phone rings, do you feel a little bit more like you get to set the narrative? Or do you feel like a little bit like the media is still wagging the dog, where you're constantly trying to respond to headlines as and when they get cooked up in the press? I think we need to look at the space uh, where the media operates. And somewhere in the press code, it says that the media must report truthfully accurate and fair. And most of the times when I read a story, I'm trying to overlay those principles when I read a story. And where a story goes horribly wrong is when um, opinion becomes fact. Mm -hmm. And so you then compromise the truth. It is when the other party is not allowed the right to respond when the story is not fair. And when it comes to accuracy, anybody is entitled to our opinions, but we're not entitled to our own facts. And to me, looking at our media today, we have to look again. Are we always projecting those values in our, in, in our reporting? Because I sometimes see a difference between, I expect a journalist when you, you, you come to an event is to report on that event. Um, and then the, the public up there that comes from different views and persuasions, you report on, on the facts, what you have seen there. But most of the time, it's not what is reported on what actually happened there. A three quarter of the story will be about the opinion of that journalist. Mm -hmm. And then I also like to understand the difference between an analyst and uh, how, do you become an analyst? how do you become an analyst? Is, is, is there an entry level for analysts? Because before the elections, I'm coming to your questions now, <laughs> the analysts just fall out of the sky and they all have an opinion. <laughs> and I think that the public really are entitled to, to, to get what political parties are really all about, not about the analyst opinion. And, and if we can go in, and we're going into a next election now, if we can try and work on those issues, the media is a partner, and we have to accept the media as a partner. But you talk about the headline. Sometimes the headline doesn't even speak to the story. <laughs> so I don't know who's responsible for the headlines. But I would see the media as a partner, and that when we're unhappy with anything on reporting like I've done yesterday and I've done before, um, they also regulate it in a way that they have to comply uh, with the press code, with the ombudsman. We have to complain to, to those structures to also hold the media to account. But then the media houses must also put more resources in your newsrooms. We, we don't see the beat reporters now that specialize in, um, in, in a specific topic. You, you just see all journalists writing on all kinds of topics, and then they have to compete with social media. Mm. And I think that competition with the social media to get out that headline, to get out that story, mm. the values and the principles of journalists, uh, journalism get compromised mm. in that. But I prefer to engage with a journalist or a media house, set up meetings regularly, mm -hmm. especially as government, to also go and give them on the record, I don't believe of the record exists, and, and just give them more information. Mm -hmm. So you've hit on a really sore point, I think, yeah. for all politicians. The, the, opinion, the opinion writer, the analyst, mm -hmm the university professor who yeah. uh, is relying on a poll that may not be representative or may not be random or properly stratified. If you had an opportunity now, we have media who are covering this event and we have media who are here as audience members. If you had an opportunity, I'll start with you, Ngabayoms, to, to put a set of basic minimum requirements for what it is that qualifies as political opinion and who gets to give it. I mean, I'll go first. I would say you have to be held accountable for your predictions. 
You mm. can't be a Sangoma who says the DA will reach a ceiling of 15% and the EFF will become the official opposition. And then you get it wrong and people invite you back to analyze the following election. That's my bugbear. Mm. If you have a particular bugbear around that and if you could influence how we think about opinion going forward, what would you say? And, and crucially, I want you to, to, to think a little bit about some of the good analysts who are out there. I don't, you no. know, this mustn't just be a trash fest. No, you're quite correct. Exactly. I, think the, I think the important thing about the question you're asking me, Lindy, is that uh, you see, when you, you provide your analysis, it's, an ex, it's supposed to be an, exit view, an expert view. So then the expectation from my side as, as a consumer of your end product, your analysis, is that at the very least take me into confidence about the scientific process you follow to arrive at a particular opinion. Because then it means I could also follow the same thing, apply the same criteria. There's nothing wrong if I arrive at a different conclusion, but at least I will judge you on the basis of a standard. But what tends to happen at times is that because some or other analyst is angry because the ANC did not uh, fulfill his promise on some or other issue, or we've had a disagreement on the issues in the past, then all you are going to do is to get a lot of trashing in the media around some of the programs that you're doing. I remember when we had our elective Congress in 2015, I don't know whether it was a deliberate strategy by the SABC to deploy someone who had absolutely nothing positive to say about the UDM in its own Congress, right? We had to put up with those things. And most of it was not based on any scientific evidence. Even if you were to look backward to say, evaluate the performance, look at some of the factors that made it difficult for us to reach a particular target in terms of our performance, none of that was considered. It was because he had an issue, for example, with President Bando Olomis as an individual. I think, but going back to the question you asked uh, Pumzile earlier uh, to say, uh, when it comes to how we are portrayed by the media, is it a question of political strategy or is it the media going that route on its own? I think it's a bit of both. Look, for, in for instance, we are a social democratic party. There are areas in our policy positions where we're completely different from the African National Congress. Yes, one has to take into account the fact that we are friends of the left, obviously, but so which means in many issues we are likely to agree on, right? We are not as different from the ANC as other parties are. But the issue is that I don't think we've been able to communicate the messages around issues that distinguish us and differentiate us from the African National mm -hmm. Congress enough. So it means that we also need to do some mm -hmm. soul searching, especially when you plan for elections. And I think, I'm going to use a raised term here, but I think it's a problem, especially for many parties who are friends of the left, who are predominantly black political parties, so to speak, who are also led by black political politicians, is that we tend to sound like the ANC. We tend to fail to distinguish ourselves from the African National Congress. But I think you also have a number of political commentators who try to be professional in their duties. Whether you're reading in newspapers or they are commenting on TV, whose analysis you respect and follow, whose analysis you know that mm. is actually based on, scient on a scientific method, right? Because even if you were to look at the same thing, look at some of the analysis, the Ipsos say for example, you had a number of political commentators who did not agree with it. But those who are politically aligned obviously are going to push that narrative for their own uh, hidden agendas because they are deployed there by poli certain political mm. parties. Mm. A phenomenal number of news stories are based on polls that are actually qualitative, Correct. right? Where people were phoned, you know, you know, not randomly, cannot be extrapolated, isn't representative of the whole electorate. And because that narrative isn't there, because there isn't a lot in the press around how polls are put together and whether a poll can be predictive or not predictive. It's a big issue in the United States mm -hmm. where pollsters failed to predict a Trump win, but frankly, it's been going on for a long time. Pumzi, how much of that has to do with the fact that we're in our PR system? I think, just to answer your earlier question, I think going into an election, each media house must invest in proper po polling. Um, the data, we do our own internal polling, which on election day we'll be able to accurately predict the results. But you often see during election time polls and different publications um, that make absolutely no sense. Um, so I would really, really advise for media houses to invest in better polling and in that way that they can give more accurate information to the readers about the states of different political parties. Mm. Because a lot of the information comes from poll polls that are not scientific, analysts that have been plucked out of the air who know nothing about their political party they're commenting on. So what on. makes a good analyst? 
A good analyst is someone, I think Eusebius Makaza, for example, is a good a a analyst. Uh, Eusebius has taken, I think he's one of the few actually, who's actually taken time to understand the DA, read its constitution, read its, its different rules, understand how the party works, and then when he asks questions, he asks from a place of knowledge, mm -hmm. where it isn't just the lazy, oh, the DA is such a racist party, what's your view? He asks more like substantive questions about policy and not the lazy, oh yes, uh, someone has tweeted something, it, it's proof once again that you're racist. It's, it's more substance and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to talk to him because you can have an intellectual discussion about the DA and not just the lazy uh, prism that the DA is viewed in. But Mwaba, isn't having analysts who know your constitution and who know your rules and regulations the luxury of a big party that governs? And isn't it maybe possible that, as, that the DA, as it has grown, has forgotten what it was like to be that scrappy outfit that was grateful even just to get a line in of comments after a minister had made an announcement? You know, how, how much are journalists to blame for not knowing the constitutions, the rules and regulations, the disciplinary processes of every single one of the actually many opposition parties we have? Look, in this if we are going to if we are going to talk about the UDM in the program, the expectation is that at least we must know. Uh, the UDM as a political animal. Otherwise, what kind of analysis are you going to do? The, the other question which I think is important is that it's happened even with the Bobani matter. Uh, when we're trying to deal with Bobani at uh, the Nelson Mandela yes. Bay Metro in our own way, people look, kept on looking at uh, the UDM in the prison of either the Democratic Alliance or the African National Congress. They use that as a barometer, as a standard. Mm -hmm. We have a different process of how we deal with issues internally and we're not apologetic about it, right? We may have made mistakes along the way, but I think we followed our constitution and our guide to procedure to the latter. But I think the other issue here is that uh, uh, at times, the questions center around stale issues that we've moved far beyond from. For example, if you find that President Olomis had made a mistake during the floor crossing era, I mean, 2018, I shouldn't be talking about the floor crossing that happened long before even my time in the United Democratic Movement. Those are the kind of questions you are asked. Uh, but I think it is also to understand where we are located ideologically before you even ask us questions. Because remember, I, I remember I've attended a few interviews where I'm asked about SOEs, whether you should privatize them. I mean, I'm, I'm a social democrat. The answer would be an emphatic no. But surely you should have known that question long before you came to ask me that question or called for an interview. Because if I say no and I give you a closed-ended question, what are you going to ask me further? Because it means you haven't done your preparation. Well, you don't understand the character of the political organization that you're dealing with at the time. And, 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 and now what is new actually is that I think we should deal with this matter is that we are treating Cyril Ramaphosa the same way that the media at some point treated former President Nelson Mandela, right? He walks on water. If you say anything that criticizes him, chances are that part that criticizes Cyril Ramaphosa is going to be cut out of the sunlight. Right? And it happens a lot, especially with the national broadcaster. Some of the people, instead of asking you a question objectively about a political issue that you are trying to address as a party, guess what they do? They try to guide your responses, try to channel you towards a particular direction to say, maybe easy not. That's not his duty. Uh, the issue is that the UDM has taken a particular position on a matter and that's what we want to communicate. You can interrogate us on the basis of how we arrived at that, we are fine, but don't try to change my opinion into what you want it to be. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pivot a little bit and I'm going to use your um, mention of the public broadcaster as my, my entry point. Yes. Um, Pumzile, Honorable Mayor and myself, we've all served on the Communications Committee and we have experienced the growth trajectory or the decline and then slow recovery and then further decline uh, of the public broadcaster, a, a critically important institution. Mm -hmm especially when it comes to electoral coverage. I, you know, we have smaller political parties in particular get, uh, according to electoral law, um, you know, coverage that is free, advertising that is free through the public broadcaster um, in an effort to make you know, political party coverage more equitable. Um, tell me what it's like to sit on a communications committee and in a sense have debates about and argue with politicians about regulating a media which in many ways is actually 
a stone in your foot. You know, we've, had a, we've heard a lot of complaints from all of you about what is wrong with the way the media covers politics. But here in the SABC as an institution that actually politicians have a, a huge role in helping to look after, nurture, elect, you know, choose leadership for, uh, and try and turn into exactly the kind of broadcaster that South Africans deserve. Tell us about what that journey has been like. Uh, being part of overseeing an institution that, in a sense, comes back at election time to cover you either rightly or wrongly? I think the journey for me is, um, I think I was moved to the Communications Portfolio Committee in October 2017. That was the height of cloudy season when in and out of court, trying to get him fired. And I pushed for the SABC inquiry to be held because it was quite clear that there was deep set rot at the SABC. And going through the SABC inquiry itself was very, very harrowing. It was harrowing to see young black professional, professionals who were treated like rubbish because they wouldn't told Saudi's uh, line, who were fired and people from uh, apartheid brought in back to take their jobs. So it was a really, really painful experience and, and it's why I am so passionate about my oversight over the SABC. I'm on their backs and apparently they call me that Van Damme when they <laughs> talk about me. But it's, it's something that I'm really, really passionate about. I think I have a little bit of hope with the current board. Um, I think we selected some good people um, and they are doing the right things and um, they've inherited a public broadcaster that is completely broke and we're obviously in a fight with them now about um, the airing of um, President Ramaphosa's speech as, a, as state president when he was in fact addressing the nation as an ANC, ANC president, president no and sense. their refusal to follow the BCCSA code of conduct. So mm -hmm. we've, we're taking that to um, the BCCSA and we're hoping it will be resolved via tribunal because I think it's a really important issue because that showed the, the SABC being a mouthpiece for the ANC and allowing other political parties the opportunity to also be given a broadcast and give their opinion on um, land expropriation without compensation. The right thing to do would have been say ANC and all other parties represented in parliament, here's a slot, speak, sort it out quickly. They chose to dig in the heel and fight mm. and we have to fight back. Mm. Patricia. Do you agree with Kate Skinner when she says um, all is not as bad under the SABC today as it was in the SABC under apartheid? Uh, I agree with her that things have improved uh, because SABC is not only just about television, it's also about radio. Mm -hmm. I saw Stephen Grotes here early on this, uh, this afternoon and the first thing I do in the morning is to switch on my radio. Um, and there has also been a great attempt to recognize all the different languages in, in, in our country. Um, but as a public institution, it need, need to be held accountable by our public representatives. And, you know, I think the public representatives must play a much bigger role um, in the policy, the content policy, the whole editorial and all of that. And the policy looks good on, good on paper, but it's not implemented that way. Um, the, the, the policy seems to be saying it's a public broadcaster, but it gets used as a private broadcaster by the ruling party. And the opposition parties must never stop. You must continue to raise those issues and challenge them. Because at the end, we all owe a stake in the public broadcaster. We pay our licenses. Uh, it's run by our taxes and all of that. But I do think that there is an improvement um, from during the days of apartheid. Look, some good uh, uh, programs, for instance, I remember the, the editors on a Sunday afternoon, Sunday morning, when they dropped the editors. It was a very good program. 
and I see it's come back now, but only for like half an hour between half past six in the morning and seven on a Sunday. So we need to fight to get those kind of voices and program back onto the public broadcaster and own it ourselves and not allow the ruling party to, to, to exploit it. Patricia, do you think, you know, I heard one of the panelists say earlier that the government pays for the SABC. Government doesn't pay for the SABC. Mm. It's funded by advertising. 3%. And it's funded by TV licenses. The smallest yeah. funder, actually, of the SABC is the state. Yes. It's not even overseen by government, right? It's a, mm. it's a creature of parliament, mm. a creature of the constitution. So do you think people understand what a public broadcaster in a post-apartheid democratic state like ours should look like? Or do you think there actually needs to be a fundamental conversation around the nature of having a public broadcaster in the mold of, say, PBS in the United States or the BBC in the UK? I mean, these are other English language markets. You know, how do people perceive the role of a, a, an institution like the SABC? And is Parliament helping or hindering that image mm. by constantly having to intervene, constantly fighting with ministers? You know, is it, is it just, you know, exacerbating the yeah. perception of the SABC as a government institution? I, I do think we need more competition in the market. Um, you know, a big percentage of South Africans um, make use of the SABC only, and if we can bring in more competition, it will certainly be better. But the, the content, we can have as many programs that we have or want, but how do we also make sure that the content of those programs that's brought up to millions of South Africans, that we have a say in that? Because the SABC, like any other institution in this country, cannot escape transformation. Now, I know transformation is a dirty word for many people. Transformation certainly doesn't mean replacing white faces with black faces. Transformation means that you need to the core of the business and transform the core of the business. And I don't think SABC has been fully transformed yet. Rabbi Omzi, anything to add? No, Lindy, I think you asked an important question earlier and I might have forgotten to close the circle on that important question, where you were saying we constantly have to punch above our weight in order to be noticed, especially for us as smaller parties. But look, what I don't understand about this issue is that it's South Africans themselves who, cho who chose to make us a multi-party democracy. That's, South, that's what South Africans chose. They didn't say we want the DA, the ANC, and the EFF. They said we, all, we want all the other parties to also be part of the equation for our democracy. Up until South Africans decide to say they want two or three political parties, some level of attention, proportional obviously to their support, mm. should be given to those parties and what they're doing because that will be respecting the will and the wish of the people of South Africa. It's as simple as that. But I think I must, I must add this and say, when I was preparing for, to participate in the SABC inquiry, the first thing I had to do, obviously, was to try and catch up, read committee documents, committee reports, read everything that I had to do with the SABC so I could be able to make a meaningful contribution in that process. And one of the things I picked up, uh, Pumzile is, is quite right in saying, she was a lone voice in that committee in terms of calling for an inquiry, in terms of trying to expose or to talk about some of the issues that made the ruling party uncomfortable as to what was happening in the SABC. Now, as is always the case, is that as soon as something is done properly, they claim the credit for it, even though it started elsewhere. But it shows again the value of oppositions of opposition party politics in the country. It shows the value of opposition working together. Obviously, we're not saying partnering with the media, but allowing the media as well space to play its role as the fourth estate mm. in deepening and strengthening democracy. Right. Um, I, I want to talk about two more things before we open up for Q&A. The first is social media. Um, I, I had a little gimmick, and Moisen Ndlozi has ruined it for me. He couldn't join us today. He's actually unwell. I mustn't be cruel to our friend. But um, I calculated that between us on this stage, if Mbuyuseni had been able to join us, we would have 1,150,000 followers on Twitter. Now, obviously, there's crossover. Some people are following all of us, some of us. And so if I'm generous, I'd say a million Twitter followers. How does that change the calculus when you, again, as opposition party leaders in a contested space where you're struggling for coverage and struggling for uh, narratives that are a true reflection of who you are um, as institutions and also as individuals, how has social media changed that calculus? I know from a personal point of view, since I left politics, 
I don't have to issue press statements. I just say something on Twitter. It's got the tick, so it's not fake and it's clear. Uh, but there's also the scourge of fake media, right? People mm. still make fake pictures, fake posts. Um, so what are the challenges and what are the advantages in terms of interacting with your voters, interacting with your audience directly and in an unmediated fashion? Let's start with you, Pumzi. Um, I think it's been great for me in the sense that I have one-on-one -on -one conversations with journalists. Uh, I, I follow a lot of journalists and they follow me. And I know that they don't always read um, DA statements when they come in their inbox because they think they're too many. So I'll tweet my statement and I'll know that they'll see it. Um, so it's been helpful in that sense. Um, yeah, and it's also great to interact with people. But also there's also the really nasty side where there's bots that come in and attack you. And, and I've, I've set limits to Twitter because it can be quite a toxic space and make you feel very negative. So I've put, I try, I'm, I'm, it's not working, I'm gonna try harder, to, <laughs> to get off Twitter at 8 p.m. so I can focus on other things because you end up Sit, sitting there all day scrolling in bed at night looking at Twitter and the insults coming at you, puppets, uh, house negro, whatever, whatever. And it can build, uh, even, even though we're tough and you, we, we're taught to be tough in politics, you have to be tough in politics. After a while, it does start you know, hurting. Mm. So I'm also not shy to use the mute and block button. Mm. Um, they, I, I have freedom of association, mm. and I have freedom not to be called names mm. all the time on social media. Mm. I mean, Patricia, recently yes. you've, you've taken to Twitter essentially to air your side of the story that has been a, a huge to and fro. Yeah. How has that changed the game for you since the last time you found yourself in a similar position? Well, certainly what I like about social media is the speed with way, the way things get out almost immediately. Um, and I think what I said earlier on, maybe that is, and to, especially in breaking news, that's maybe sometimes where the media has to compete and your newspaper only comes out the next morning and the story is broken already on social media. Uh, so I think there's a lot of value in social media but uh, on the other hand, like Pumsiri is saying, uh, people can be very nasty on social media. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I have, I mean, I can take a lot also, but once people start swearing at you, I mean, it's my phone, I pay for my air time, I block you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> so, and, but also on the positive side, I have received a lot of support during my recent fight with, with the DA uh, on social media, and, and, and I'm grateful for that. But I do think that, um, the, unlike in when a journalist writes a story, there are certain principles that they have to adhere to, that's not on social media. I mean, it's just a free for all. Mm. But it, 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 it is a good medium, and I think that we, those of us who can respond in a positive way, um, I never fight back on Twitter unless it's absolutely necessary because the people are just waiting for you to come and, and, and say something. So, social media is good, but I, I think uh, there are many, many people out there that are abusing it. Mm. Quite correct, uh, quite correctly. And I think the, the most important thing is that, especially for a party of our size, it has made it possible for us to communicate with our constituency more effectively. I remember in the past when, especially during the list period, when you are going to go to elections, the first thing that people would ask you is that, where have you been all along? What have you been doing? Apart from accounting to party structures, you have levels of the party where it would not be possible for you to account to. And then it makes it easier for us to reach them, communicate with them. But obviously you also have, what I do is to profile the kind of people that fo follow me in a particular social network. For instance, I know that I would engage in a different way to people on Facebook as I do to on Twitter and all of that. I think uh, we all do that. But you know, when I look at 
how active my leader is on social networks. Mm. I don't think I can ever keep up. There was a point <laughs> where I tried to compete with him and I failed this my lead. <laughs> uh, and then when he tried to ask me questions about why I'm not as active as I should be, I said, remember, you allow me to do most of the donkey work behind the scenes, so I don't have enough time to be loading posts on social networks. But if I do, I'll, I'll post them. But I think the other issue is to say, that it's, a, it's a, exactly what uh, Pumzile is saying. It's about the responsible use of, so, of social mm. media. But it's also a, about us understanding the responsibility that those interactions with South Africans places on our shoulders, mm. right? You can't be something else when you're standing at a podium in parliament, right, talking about your values, you're saying your spouse particular values, but you become a completely different animal when you interact with the same South Africans on a space that you consider to be your personal space. Obviously, that means that you can't allow people to abuse you as well. Mm -hmm. it's, it's completely out of the question. But you get to a point where you have to stop narcotizing yourself with e-noise so that you can be able to clear your head and focus on some of the more important things because you can't lead if all you're going to do is to mm. try and, 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 and respond to every conversation yeah. and criticism yes. that people level at you. It's, it comes with the territory. That's why I would post an old post every now and then or say something when I think it's, I have something important to say. Yeah. Other than that, focus on what we need to do, building a better South Africa for all. So you're talking about balance. Exactly. Which not yes. all politicians yeah, no. have established on you. Not true. <laughs> so, I'm going to jump to our last uh, topic. Um, and this is particularly for you, Pumzile and Patricia, but um, you know, Ngaba Yomzi, I'd be interested in your view. It's, it's around gender and representation of women politicians in the media. Okay. Uh, Pumzile, you've been at the receiving end of some quite invasive, very personal media coverage about your family, your history. Um, Patricia, I lost it on social media when people called you, what did they call you, power hungry? Uh, call me when a man is called power hungry and then I'll cease to be angry when yes. a woman is called power hungry. Um, how? And, you know, I find myself in a position where I've started an organization whose purpose is to transition quality people into the public service so that we can displace some of that dysfunction that the public service is known for. But how is it possible to convince talented young women to run for office if they watch other women in politics being savaged in the press, being submitted to scrutiny over their clothing, asked about family life balance, uh, you know, yeah. accused of, you know, have coded language used, yeah, yeah, against them, uh, you know, in reference to their leadership style. You know, again, if you, if you, if you could use this as a platform to talk to the media about their represent representations of women in power, yeah. uh, what would you say? Well, I, yes, I would think first Sorry, of all, what, start with the man. what I would like to see from the media is there's always an adjective before um, a woman politician, either fiery or feisty or all kinds of things. Please, um, we all are different people. Um, and sometimes, I mean, I was at the World Trade Center negotiating um, the, the interim constitution, part of the whole negotiating, and I was the only woman leading a delegation there. And just to illustrate what I'm saying is that Cyril Ramaphosa, Ruth Mayer, Joe Slover, they're all there. And they will make a point and they will bang on the table. And the response from the media is powerful. I do the same. Look how aggressive is that woman. <laughs> so really, please. We don't want just to be in the news when we are about controversy. That's when women are normally in the media around controversy. But we're also in a game. We're in a game of politics. And in a game of politics, you don't have rules for men. You don't have rules for women. They're just the rules. And we play by the rules. But in some way, we get boxed into rules for women. When we can behave exactly the same. I was listening to a debate with Farrell Hafaji on a, a few months ago on this issue. And I think she, she put it very well to say that there's almost different standards for women and different standards for men. And that's where the opinion comes in. Because it is your opinion about that person. And you should not be reporting on your opinion about that person, but reporting on what that person is saying 
or when the person is making news, report on that. And, and if we can get that right, we will begin to create the space where even young women can feel that they want to become a politician, that they want to be a leader in there. But politics is also not for sissies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, if they, if they clap you, you must simply clap them back. And, 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 and find that it's all, it's all about balance. Just a last point for me in government is that, you know, I find it very hard to get out the good news of what we are delivering or services mm -hmm. to the people. Because we rely on the media to help us to get that good news story out there. And I would also like to see a balance between the bad stories that sell the papers and, 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 and good news stories. And, and if we can get that balance right for me, um, I think um, we don't want the media to be the mouthpiece or the praise singers or the bongi for politicians, <laughs> but let us just have a balance between good news and bad news. Pumzile. So I, like uh, the mayor, have been called all sorts of names, arrogant, aggressive, rude. <laughs> Um, but the one that stuck is feisty, and, and the media uses that word quite often. The feisty Pumzile Van Damme. Well, I don't mind it, but... I, it's it, like you're a poodle that barks <laughs> above its yes, station. Yes. Yeah. And let me give an example. So I resigned earlier this year as the national spokesperson. I did so for personal reasons. I was burnt out. I wanted to study. I wanted to start a family. I'm young. I've got 40 years of a political career if I want. I don't have to do everything now. I, I have a personal life that I need to take care of. So I said this to the, to the media. It was a story about, no, she has been bullied by the men and blah, blah, blah. So women in the DA are portrayed as these fragile little things that can't fight for themselves, which is not true. Um, I, the last thing I am is a fragile little thing. <laughs> um, so, so um, and then just to give an example, and then a few months later, another colleague resigned from parliament, a white man, to go to MIT. DA man goes to MIT, congratulations, wonderful. But for me, it was, oh no, weak little woman has been bullied and she had, has now stepped down from her position. When that wasn't the case. So I'd really like the media to improve their reporting about women in the DA. Um, there are many, many strong women in the DA. There are many hardworking women in the DA. We're not fragile little things that are controlled. We're not puppets. We have our own agency. It's dehumanizing to be told that, oh no, the only reason that you're doing well is because someone's given you a leg up when it's my hard work that's gotten me to where I've been. I've worked extremely hard. So I'd really... Yeah, I feel like I've been bashing the media a lot. We love you. <laughs> we really, really love you. I mean, I think it's possible to be constructive. You yeah. Know? yeah. Because I think sometimes the sexism is couched in complementary terms, right? Yeah. So I, you know, I cringe sometimes when I see the adjectives used to describe former presidential, ANC presidential candidate Lindiwe Sisulu, right? Or when I think back to my own career and the times my hair would actually make mainstream news, right? So it's, it's quite de dehumanizing, whether you're put on a pedestal or squashed under somebody's heel, right? Mm -hmm. That women's appearance and their desirability and their sexual availability are all actually measures of their leadership in addition to what it is men have to, uh, you know, to, to the, the same, the levels that men have to reach in order to be respectable leaders. But increasingly, it isn't just women, right? So Ngabayomzi, you and, you know, I hesitate to call him the Honorable Bay because it's actually dehumanizing, right? Yeah, it, is. it seems cute because we're saying, no, but you're good looking. But yeah. actually, is it wrong to, 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 to treat male political leaders in the same way, to objectify, to use the tools of sexism on, in a sense, the more powerful sex? Look, at, uh, as we are saying, it's very dehumanizing, but one has, uh, has, has dealt with this matter and treated it with extreme humility. 
because I think in the main most South Africans when when they follow such uh, such descriptions of people like myself is that they do it with the best intentions but obviously there are some people who do it with uh, opposite intentions but I think what I've said in the past is that uh, look I'm a, it's slightly different in my case because I think uh, because I'm a man they usually mean it in a very complimentary way mm. right and I'm supposed to respond in that manner uh, but it is unfortunate that one gets characterized in that fashion rather than what he stands for as a leader because it can be quite a distraction at times. I stand for something as a young leader. I am not about my looks. I've never been. There are a set of values and a set of co and a contribution that one wants to make in South Africa. I think uh, to a large extent that's how I've handled it. But I said in the past to, um, I remember having an interaction with the general, I, would say, I said to him, it's, 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 is it a failure on our part or on my part to communicate what we stand for as a party or what I stand for as a leader mm -hmm. that people have actually decided to focus on other things? Yeah. Mm. Right? Or is it a failure on our part as a party to communicate our value proposition clearly so that my looks don't distract attention away from what we stand for as a party? Those are questions that I cannot answer. Those are questions that we can answer as a collective. But I feel at some point, going back to the question you were saying, that the kind of coverage you get, it's almost like you are, you are guilty before being proven innocent. The minute there's some kind of scandal about you or something wrong that people think you've done, you are always on the back foot because you're a public figure, because you're a politician and all of that nonsense, uh, which is problematic. And it borders on the same kind of, even if you are a man, uh, the same kind of ca characterization that dehumanizes you or seeks to do that even if it doesn't succeed. I find it problematic at times. But look, if uh, people mean it in a good way, and I said to General, uh, because I'm a politician, and it ends up get getting us votes in 2019, <laughs> so be it. I'm kidding, obviously. But I think the, I want to underscore the point you ma we made about, I think, uh, you mentioned something about fake news. And I want to stress this point that yeah, during this era of fake, fake news, I saw one of the banners outside that says, the truth is the best investment, right? Uh, something along those lines in one of the banners there is that during this post-truth era, there's a huge responsibility, not only on our shoulders as public representatives and political leaders, but on the media itself to ensure that it informs, it reports the truth more factual information so that it can be relied upon. There are many publications, not just the national broadcaster, including some media houses, where it's difficult to tell between what's fake news and real news. That is because uh, people now focus more on sensationalizing issues and trying to, it's more the profit motive that is driving the agenda and forgetting about the social objectives of why we have a media in the first, in the first place as a fourth estate. And if we don't do that properly, we are going to have a situation where not only are people going to make wrong decisions, but South Africa as a country is going to be led by people in the future who do not have the best interest of South Africans at heart. Because the other issue that you must consider is that Mayor Delil is quite correct in saying, ever since President Zuma left office, I said, I looked at myself, sat down and said, besides, yes, we held the government to account as the opposition, but at a personal level as a leader, Apart from shouting at Zuma, what contribution have I made in society about the problems that face our society? Mm -hmm. And when I went back, I said, apart from the support that Parliament gives me to be able to do constituents' work, I have not gone beyond that. I should. Mm -hmm. Most of the issues that we have in our manifestos, as you know, are low-hanging fruits that we can do ourselves as political parties. But we don't, because what we want to do at times is to turn around to and oppose. blame other people and oppose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to open the floor. I know we're over time, and I really am grateful to all of you for your patience, um, but I think it would be remiss of me not to give you a chance to ask some questions. So if the microphone people are still around, please raise your hand, and I wish you luck uh, in being invited to ask a question. I'm going to ask my young lady friend here at the front to go first. Um, and I see a hand there in the first row, you, gentleman in the white shirt. Uh, aren't you from UCT? You asked a question in the last session. Yes, it was a very good question. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah, you may ask a question. Uh, go ahead. Um, good afternoon. My name is Inagoni Namshawli. I'm from Khrwetiski High School. So I have to stay. Yes, please. <laughs> okay, so uh, my question is for ma'am. 
Um, at the end of July, I went on a Adventures into Citizen Camp and we got the opportunity to go to the Civic Center to see how our town is run and all of that. And um, one of the statements that were made was that Ma'am would continue to serve as mayor and then recently Ma'am resigned. So I would just like to know, um, did Ma'am resign because of the motions of confidence against her? Thank you. Um, before you answer, I'm going to take a round just to give as many people a, ch a chance as, poss as possible. So if you could ask a question, uh, is there anyone on this side? Okay, uh, three and four, and let's say five over here, and six, the lady with the glasses. That's it. That's the round. Go for it. Thank you, Sis India. I thought you weren't going to note me. I appreciate it very much. Yeah, I was enjoying the conversation around the role of language and adjectives with regards to sex very much, and I think my question, I want to steer it into the direction of race, right? because on stage we see uh, black political leaders. So I want to understand how it makes you feel in terms of your race, your depictions in terms of media. And I want to zoom in on Zapiro particularly, because understanding uh, historical connotations of representation uh, of black people upon discovering colonialism, Zapiro has very grotesque representations of black politicians. Oh. So big heads, big faces, big feet, how does that make you feel in relation to that? And also with relation to your white counterparts, because you saw with the standoff uh, scandal, we didn't see a cartoon of Christo Visse running away with a bag of money or anything like that, whereas whenever it's a black politician involved in something in that nature, you see very derogatory and sometimes racist depictions of them. So how does that make you feel and what's your take on that? Okay, Thanks. the next people, please ask your question quickly. We're losing um, audience here. I'd uh, like to direct next? my question to Mayor Patricia DeLille and another one to Pumzile. Um, Madam Mayor, what is your analysis of how the media covered your spat with the DA? Um, you're speaking about analysts being off, so if you had to analyze how the media covered you, what would you say about that? And then Pumzile, uh, the coverage of the DA, what impact do you think Helen Zilla has, um, now that you're no longer the spokesperson, how does the fact that she's still very vocal, um, often in opposition to what the party's stance on issues like colonialism is, um, how does that impact the narrative in the media about the DA? Thank you very much. Is anybody else who has a microphone? Yes. So you've described the media narrative as being inaccurate. But we've seen um, Helen Zill giving us one view of colonialism. We've seen Herman Mashaba basically endorsing Trump and his immigration policies. We've seen Musi Maimani talk about African liberalism. We've heard you speak about social liberalism. We've heard Gavin Davis speak about the DA is a classical liberal party. It's ideologically inconsistent that the media is getting it wrong in giving an analysis of the DA when the prominent leaders of the DA are displaying to the South African pro public a moral inconsistency in their ideology. So why are you trying to come here and make it seem as if we're misunderstanding a very public difference of opinion within the leadership of the DA and trying to make it seem as if it's a monolithic ideological body when there's clearly a big spat which you're just defining as a debate. But it's not a debate and it doesn't seem healthy at all. It looks like an ideological squabble. Can I, can I, <laughs> can I, but, before you answer, um, I, I, so <laughs> thank you very much. I think we'll end the, the, the round there. Um, a very robust question, thank you very much. Um, Pumzila, do you want to answer first? I want to go first. I want to answer both questions. Um, I, did, I didn't say that DA was a monolith. I said that DA was a broad church of liberals. So the different kinds of liberals in the DA. And there is nothing that is healthier than a political party that is able to debate ideas. We are not robots. We are not robots. 
there isn't policy that's made up there and then trickled down and everyone must follow it. There is, we're currently in a policy review process. There's cer certain people who hold a, a certain view and other people who hold a different view. That's what politics is about. It's about a contestation of ideas. And that is what's happening in the DA. It's a contestation of ideas. It's unfortunate that it's spilled over into the public because usually we have those debates in federal council and our caucus meetings. But yeah, it happened that it spilled out into the public. And about Helen, um, I'm not the DA spokesperson anymore, and I don't feel that I have to account for her tweets. She is a grown woman. She knows exactly what the effect of her tweets are on the DA. So I think you must ask her that question. I'm in no way defending what she said. In fact, in fact, Musi distanced the party away from both Herman and Helen's posts, so uh, and saying that those posts are not in line with the DA. But um, Helen, you must write her an email and ask her how she feels. I don't so, think I should have come for her. So actually, Pumzile, these two questions have actually hit on something very interesting about political parties in this country which is that we treat them almost like churches. Everybody mm. must subscribe to the same mm. uh, covenant, the same hymn book. Um, everybody must sing from the same song sheet. And if they don't, and if debate breaks out into the open, it's, a, it's an aberration. Mm. It's not healthy. And, and look, I'm, I'm not just defending you because I'm actually I'm implying that the DA acts in exactly the same way as the ANC, as the UDM, as the ID before it, right? So I'm not saying it's unique to any p political party. I, I would argue it's a feature of all political parties mm. in this country. So do you think, and this is a question for all of you, that there's, there's going to be a time when, especially big governing parties, can be seen to debate one another in public. It, this happens in other countries, by the way. There are factions, there are black congressional caucuses, you know, there are freedom caucuses, there are people inside political parties who publicly debate one another in political parties all over the world. But that's not the culture here. Do you think there's an appetite for that culture? And do you think the media is in a position to cover that debate with any kind of nuance? Or is every debate about policy and about ideas always going to devolve into this personality hates that personality yeah. and is trying to push that personality out of office? Well, in, in the DA, when, the, when there's debates, it's always couched as black caucus versus the party. And often it's actually just classical liberals versus social liberals. But because, again, the DA is always analyzed from a prism of race, it's always seen as a contestation of race, of races. I mean, I'm, I'm a Darso constituency head. We had a debate the other day uh, between two people. One person was a classical liberal, the other was a social liberal. And we had a debate about this. So this is what we do in the DA. I mean, does the media have appetites for those type of debates to happen in public? I think the, I think, and do political parties. And to political parties. I would argue at the moment that they don't, that they feel this overwhelming urge to just keep it together. Yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. And if, if, if there's people disagreeing, oh no, 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 it's, it's just terrible. Yes. They can't disagree. I mean, I can disagree with my colleague sitting next to me and we can walk out of a room and still be friends. It's because liberalism is that broad that um, people can have different views on different things and it's totally okay mm -hmm. and it's good to debate it mm -hmm. so that the policy ultimately at the end is representative of something that everyone can be comfortable with. Mayor, in addition to answering the questions that were posed to you. Yes, certainly. Let me start with uh, the past year and I have to go back quite far back. Um, I certainly did not blame the media for writing some things that they were leaked to, um, fed by people, a certain narrative, um, leaked the reports and say all of these allegations are true. And then of course the media published some of these allegations as fact. And that's why I say my name had then been smeared in public because the allegations were put out there and therefore I wanted to be cleared in public by having an open hearing with the media present. 
for me, in general, if I can summarize the coverage of, of, of this, this whole spat between me and, and the DA, as the spat continued, um, and, it, and it became very clear that my fight is about the principle and not the position, and the three successful court cases that have won helped me to put this whole thing into perspective. Because I take the party's view, what they say under oath, as the official position of the party in an affidavit compared to what people said outside. But the media did also help me to, to mobilize a lot of public sympathy. Um, and I must say, it's for the first time in my life and my history as a politician, I'm almost 50 years in politics, where I had a connection with the media who assist me to get my message out. I didn't have the machinery uh, to, to support me. I was doing it single-handedly. So I would say 70, 30, I'm, I'm very happy with the way it was covered. Just on the other issue about um, why I, I resigned, um, I, I, I wrote an opinion piece in the City Press this past weekend to give exactly the reasons. But again, it was about principle, not position. I was offered a position as a member of parliament, uh, a, a, a minister in the cabinet, um, and now I've walked away from the position as mayor because I wanted to show that my fight was about principle. And that is why I resigned, because as a leader, sometimes you have to rise above these differences and put the people of the city of Cape Town first. It became clear that I wasn't able to concentrate 100% on what I've been elected to do because the mud keep coming on a daily basis. You know, just malicious. And it's almost like you're in an abusive relationship. And, and we are in Women's Month, and I've been saying all over the country to women, when you are in an abusive relationship, walk away. I've been in an abusive uh, political relationship, and that's why I resigned. I still have a lot of energy left in me, and I want to serve my country in any capacity, and I will certainly redesign my, uh, my future. Thank you. Lindy, I think the point for us, you're quite correct in saying that, uh, uh, look, we should be promoting democracy internally in our political parties. Uh, you know, quite interestingly, I'm considered, even though we're social democrats, we're not a, a homogeneous group of people within the United Democratic Movement, I'm, I'm considered to be one of the most liberal social democrats there. Come to us. <laughs> <laughs> In the party, Recruit even though I don't, I don't consider myself as such. But it's to say that we need to look, we are also in our process, we are trying to review our policies. Uh, but one of the things we said, I want to give an example about parties who don't really open up themselves to the public so that public, the public can actually be able to influence our policies. We tend to confine ourselves to just the party members. When in fact there's value in getting input in what you're trying to do, especially on the policy positions from people outside as well, who are not necessarily members of the party is to say that we are, trying to, we are trying to review our policies. We haven't started with that process, but we've, we've circulated our discussion documents internally. But the question I, I ask is, why haven't we made it possible for us to then debate those issues, add those differences of opinion around certain issues, especially when it comes to the pillars of the political parties going forward on, on key policy issues, but also allow the public to comment on such issues, so that then you inculcate this culture of democracy. We think that when you are in government one day, you are just going to become a Democrat when all along in your life you have not made it possible for democracy to flourish in some of the political parties. It's especially a problem. Maybe it's not so much of a problem in parties that are larger in size because you have a number of people in there and you can't use the top-down approach a lot, but in some of the smaller parties, you find that democracy as, as we know it uh, is under threat, is at risk, for instance. You find that it has a tendency of being a top-down approach rather than party structures informing what should be the policy position of a party on particular mm -hmm. issues. I think you're quite right in saying we should open it up. I think when, when it comes to President Zuma, especially on the emotion of confidence, 
It was as we are doing currently, as you would do in any situation where there are problems and you are trying to change the social order, is to say that you need to work together as a collective to knock it out of its equilibrium so that you can move towards the social order that you require. And I think we must not underestimate the importance of us working together. Even now that you have a leadership that seems to be the, doing the right things and trying to, to press the right buttons, that we need to continue to be vigilant, as Thomas Jefferson once put it. Because when there are signs of problems, we need to knock it back to the equilibrium point that we choose as a society, not that a particular political party decides for us. Right, ladies and gentlemen, Pumzile Van Damme. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.